And just to make sure we're efficient this morning, this, the second of the presenters will be Hang Shi. Is Hang Shi in the room? Yes. Ah, thank you. Okay. Uh, let's see. Kali Raj is actually connected. Okay, Kali Raj, uh, you're going to be the first presentation after we do the uh, stuff. Could you please touch your microphone? Hi, Jeff. Okay, excellent. Mm -hmm. We can hear you fine. Thank you. Well, we'll have you get going in just a second. So good morning, everybody. Welcome to welcome to the uh, second session of IDR for IETF 118. So we have a uh, light agenda today. We actually should have a little bit of room at the end, so we're not going to be pushing for promptness quite as much. And we do actually see some of the presentations have uh, you know, some potential for discussion, so we definitely invite that to happen uh, during this session. We're watching the clock and trying to make sure that we're fair to everybody. Next slide, please. So this is your uh, reminder for every meeting that we are covered by the IETF note well. You are expected to read and abide by this. Next slide. Got it. So if you have not done so, please use one of the QR codes either outside the room at the microphone, or we'll start passing this around so that uh, you can sign in. This ensures that we actually get ourselves a uh, meeting of appropriate size. I got it. Sorry? Oh, this room is one of my least favorite rooms for this venue. Like you're basically hiding behind the pillar and I can see part of the stuff. So uh, not ideal, although this is a good room. If you're trying to hide it from the chairs on purpose, no, that can actually be to your benefit as well. I remember chairing in this room before. I know. I think I have a picture of you in this room. Um, speaking of uh, in this room, Sue is joining us remotely. She's not feeling well this morning, so we we'll wish her well and uh, you know, feeling better. Uh, but she will be able to participate uh, you know, remotely as well. Uh, as you can see, uh, here's the agenda that's uh, posted. We'll be uh, kicking things off with uh, Kali Raj and BGP Multi Mixtop. So we're going to load those slides next. Hi everyone, this is Kali Raj. Um, I'm going to talk about BGP multi next stop attribute, uh, present it again, and uh, the changes uh, that has happened uh, from uh, ATF 117. Next slide, please. So we'll just have a recap of the background on the problem statement and uh, bird's eye view of the multi next stop attribute. We'll go over some changes uh, since IDR 117. And we have, uh, um, so during these changes and uh, some more thinking, so I'm rethinking whether the capability negotiation that was added is uh, required. We'll discuss about that. And we added a few use cases. So we'll just uh, go in a little bit of deep dive on the 4P or 6P use case uh, in this session. Next slide, please. So this is just a right recap of uh, how we express uh, next stop is in B uh, BGP. Uh, basically, uh, it just uh, tells the different uh, ways, uh, uh, different parts of the BGP update that has next stop forwarding information. It's like scattered uh, across uh, different places on the route. And uh, what MNH does is uh, basically try to uh, consolidate this and provide proper scoping and carry multiple of these uh, uh, forwarding informations, forwarding instructions on a per route basis. Uh, in a way that is agnostic to which address family it uh, is being we have been uh, talking about. Next slide, please. So basically, the problems in the way we have is we uh, are unable to advertise more than one next stops, not easily extensible to newer endpoint types or encapsulation types, and AdPath AdPath is the only way we have to express uh, more uh, than one uh, next stops for a route. And uh, it is unable to express the relationship between the next stops. And also, it's like uh, scaling heavy. Um, and inability to signal NCAP information uniformly across the families. For example, cannot signal labels for SAFI-1 routes. And this is what we'll touch, uh, touch on uh, with the 4P or 6P use case. 
um yeah next slide please so this is just a bird's eye view of uh, multi next of attribute so where uh, the main uh, building block is the forwarding instruction which has a forwarding action and set of forwarding arguments and uh, the mnh attribute basically has a primary path uh, which which contains one or more forwarding instructions it can contain a backup path which has the same set of forwarding instructions and then a label descriptor can be used to describe labels advertised in a route uh, where the basically it's just giving information about what the label uh, means at the advertising node next slide please so yeah these are the changes to the draft since the last idr uh, session um, basically moved some use cases that were based on the uh, uh, mnh draft from the bdpct draft to this draft which were basically uh, talking about how do we signal uh, intent over a pec attachment circuit uh, that's uh, for example enabling uh, dscp signaling in the bgp routes using the mnh attribute uh, so it's just telling to the uh, ce router on a safi one route uh, that you can use a dscp code to uh, to send traffic and uh, exercise a certain colored colored uh, path or signal an mpls label so that uh, in the data traffic the ce can uh, send uh, the data traffic with a label that label is exercising a particular transport class path so these are the use cases that moved from bgpct draft to the mnh draft and then we added a new illustration new use case that's the 4p uh, use case which we'll talk about in in this session next slide please so this is the question about whether the capability is really needed so initially this uh, attribute was an optional transitive attribute and that is when this uh, uh, concern was uh, raised and we added the capability as well as we made the attribute as uh, um, optional non transitive so being an optional non transitive attribute that stops the propagation as an unrecognized attribute um uh, through speakers that don't understand it um and if we add an add side rule uh, if we add a receive side rule uh, to stop the unintended propagation across a supported node then we may not need the capability so the problem with having a capability uh, ne negotiated open capability is that whenever there is a config change it will cause stress and bounds so i am thinking that that may be uh, troublesome for uh, operations so i'm thinking of adding this uh, text where we say that um, if a node that supports uh, mnh attribute if it receives uh, the attribute on a session where it is not uh, enabled then mm -hmm. uh, the attribute can be treated as a unrecognized non transitive attribute so which will um, provide the additional protection against unintended propagation of this attribute over a session where it is not expected to be received uh, so this is the text i'm thinking of adding i just want to bring this up uh, in this session so we can discuss it on the list and make the changes uh, as we go forward next slide please yeah so this is the main thing that we i wanted to talk about in this session so here we just have a 4p or a 6p use case where we typically want to signal a mpls label which is like a mostly explicit now for safi one routes so here i've just taken an example of a option c network which has multiple domains and it's a mix of uh, domains in the sense that they are heterogeneous in the sense that some of them are ipv4 cores and some of them are ipv6 cores so here uh, the domain 1 and domain 3 are egress domains where domain 1 is ipv4 core and domain 3 is a ipv6 core and domain 2 and domain 4 are ingress domains where uh, domain 1 is ipv4 and domain 4 is ipv6 core so and the afi safi uh, um the ipv4 unicast and ipv6 unicast routes are received um at domain 1 and domain 3 and uh, how do we provide uh, reachability or forwarding for these address families when we have a mix of these kind of domains so what is required is uh, the, basically the problem is that the p routers let's say p11 in ipv4 core um they may not be v6 capable that was the problem with 6p right and so if uh, we don't get an explicit null uh, the p11 may not be able to forward the uh, v6 traffic that's arriving properly to p11 uh, but it's possible that 
P12, there's another P router which doesn't need explicit null. Uh, it's able to forward it uh, properly. Um, but because we needed to advertise explicit null, um, 6P, we advertised the V6 unicast routes into V6 LU. And that used to, that worked fine with an intradomain case, but if we go intradomain, then we need to um, think further. And because IPv6, unica, IPv6 labeled was not used at that point for anything else in the transport, so we were able to do that. But if we come to the IPv6 core, that's the English domain three. So in this case, a V4 unicast has this problem. So basically when the V4 unicast comes, um, how do we advertise it out? And uh, so what is required is uh, we need to be able to advertise a label for the V4 unicast route. So on the right, we have these uh, approaches shown. There are two approaches that's possible. One is like you keep the address family consistent for IPv6 service route. We advertise it consistently in Affis Happy 1.1. And for IPv6 service route, we advertise it in address family 2.1. And wherever we need to advertise a label, there additionally with the Affi Safi 1.1 or 2.1 route, advertise a, a MNH with an explicit null label or a real label, whichever is required. And the transport layer uh, remains uh, Safi 4 with one or two, uh, Afi 1 or 2. So this has a consistent uh, address family at uh, each layer across all the domains, which makes uh, management easy, in my opinion. There is no cross-family redistribution. But if we contrast this with an approach which uh, overloads Safi 4 to carry the service routes, so we see that um, the service routes that are received in IPv4 um, I unica status family in domain one that will need to be translated to IPv4 uh, labeled, which means that when the routes are crossing across domains to uh, across the domain boundary boundary to domain two, domain four, they will need to be translated to um, SAFI four. And similarly, IPv6 service needs to be translated between uh, SAFI two four, um, FSAFI SAFI two four, and FSAFI SAFI two one. And at the transport, we already have v4 label being used as a transport family in one of these cores. So essentially what we are seeing is there's like a redistribution happening between the v4 service uh, families 1.1 and 1.4 and uh, 2.4 and 2.1. And also because the SAFI4 families are already carrying transport routes. So there's like automatically the service routes are coming into the transport family. So there's like redistribution mesh between all the families and we need to be able to uh, do some uh, additional checks based on communities or other things. And these kind of things looks very risky to me. And uh, so, so this just contrasting the two approaches and uh, um, recommending and requesting that we go with an approach which keeps the uh, address family consistent across all the domains so that it's easier for manage uh, in future. Next slide, please. So this just shows uh, the layout of the MNH attribute. How will it look like for the 4P case when it is an IPv6 core? Uh, sorry, this is actually an IPv4 core. So basically when it is an IPv4 core, we will have a next stop, which is like an IPv4 map v6 address and the label will be the explicit null. Next slide, please. So this is just a pure IPv6 core where we just have a unicast, uh, IPv6 unicast address and uh, a label zero. So, that's what uh, the MNH looks like. Next slide, please. Okay, so that brings me to the end of the presentation. Uh, so the next steps is uh, so the draft is already in the queue for uh, adoption and uh, we still need to work on the implementation and uh, we solicit more input from the working group, request more reviews. If there are any questions, I can take that now. So you have the microphone. This is just, am I hearable, Jeff? We can hear you. Okay. This is to announce we will start working group adoption call for this this next week, probably today. So please at, make sure to ask questions of Kali Raj uh, so that you can discuss the adoption on the list. Thank you. Thank you, Sue. Satya? Hello, Satya from okay. Cisco Systems. So I had two observations regarding this. 
I think the capability negotiation probably is not needed. I think it limits the deployment of this. And secondly, this attribute is defined as uh, a non-transitive, whereas uh, you know the router capability, the next stop capability draft is optional transitive. So I think it's a little bit diverging. So I would request like the working group to go over these points. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, Satya. So basically, um, that's in line with, uh, I mean, the point about uh, capability negotiation, that's in line with my understanding. Uh, but the non-transitive thing, I think it's uh, good to have non-transitive, though it has the cumbersome thing about uh, having the RR upgraded. But I think once RR is upgraded, that problem is solved. So but it provides additional protection against uh, unintended propagation. Okay, I guess there will be more discussion on this, but thank you. Sure, thanks. Okay, and I have the queue now. And uh, one of my comments, uh, Kali Raj, is uh, echoing Satya's. We're, we're looking at uh, getting some analysis by the working group on this proposal on a few fronts. One of them is no scoping, which is partially discussed about the optional uh, tra uh, non-transitivity in this case. You know, Satya makes the point that we have a new mechanism for the next top capability that provides a different flavor of this. So the working group should take a look at uh, you know, how we want to actually encapsulate this. A second piece is you know, attribute escape, which uh, has become near and dear to my heart at least, uh, and making sure that we don't accidentally have this get somewhere else, get bound to the inappropriate routes and do the wrong thing. And the third thing that uh, is necessary to take a look is uh, consistent uh, incremental deployment. One of the things that I have uh, some concern on in the proposal, and I'd like to have the working group you know give their scrutiny to it, is how the multi next top attribute behaves on a hop by hop basis. You know, picking an easy example, if you have you know three gateways as part of the route, uh, what happens when one of the legs is unresolvable at one specific leg? Does it get stripped off before being passed? Does it uh, you know, just simply become unresolvable there and maybe become resolvable at a second hop, you know, et cetera? So I, I'm not saying there needs to be any specific discussion or answers at this moment, but this is a review we're looking for as part of the adoption process. Sure. To quickly answer that, so basically the attribute is expected to be um, consumed at a receiver. And if it is a next stop self free advertisement, then the attribute is not carried forward, but a new attribute can be attached by the advertiser. But only if the um, route is reflected as the next stop unchanged, then the attribute is uh, reflected as it is. Exactly. And that's the exact type of discussion we're looking for. Uh, Kerry has the next set of comments. Hey, Kali Raj. Um, I was just going to say that uh, more than non-transitive, you're looking for the behavior that you described at an EBGP boundary. You want to be able to filter it. If, you, if mm -hmm. next stop is, if the RRs do next stop unchange, which is usually the case, then you want to forward it as long as the other end understands it. So I suggest mm -hmm. if um, my preference would be that you really consider it as an optional transitive and then put the filtering rules in place exactly like how um, the the next stop um, entropy label draft has sort of solved it along the lines. That was the first comment. Um, the second comment that I had was, um, and I haven't looked at the draft, the recent version, so please bear with me, but now there are multiple ways to signal labels. And you, I'm hoping you have some text that talks about the consistency between prefixed uh, BGPLU, uh, where you carry the labels inside prefix, and now with M MNH, yeah? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, so yeah, I can um, add some text with respect to prefix it. So, so what is there today is like uh, the comparison between how it interacts with the label in the 8277 and Lari, but how it uh, compares with prefix it, I can add, add that. Yeah. And my suspicion is that you want to give the labels that are carried in MNH more preference than prefix mm -hmm. it. So you may want to add some text that says, hey, the priority is in the following order in case you see the labels that are being carried across three different ways. And by the way, the labels are different just in case because got the it. implementation has gone out of sync or something, you know? Got it, got it. And about your first point, actually, initially, the draft was in that state where it was optional transitive and we had the filtering rules. 
but based on the input we got in the working group, it was made non-transitive. But we can discuss this more on the list. Sure. Thank you. Thanks. There is currently nobody in the queue, no other questions in the room. So I think we're ready to go with the next presentation. Thank you, Kalaraj. Thank you, Jeff. Our next presentation is going to be advertising SaaS performance paths metrics using BGP. Hey, hello, everyone. My name is Han uh, from Huawei. I'm going to talk about advertising SaaS path performance metric using BGP. Uh, so the background is uh, in the uh, SE1 is used for the enterprise to connect the branch and uh, the headquarters. Basically, it's an IPsec over L3 VPN pass, and uh, uh, BGP is used as a control plan to to advertise the uh, the IPsec attribute and the pet, uh, port attribute to to each other, so they can establish the IPsec terminal. And for the enterprise, they are using more and more uh, SaaS application. For example, the Office uh, 365 or, or Dropbox or, or Salesforce. And those SaaS applications are usually deployed in the cloud for the better scalability. Deployed in the cloud means that they can be accessed from multiple sites. Uh, for example, in the in the branch, uh, it can be directly in, in the branch or or through the SE1 terminal, uh, go to the headquarter and the headquarter access the, the SaaS application. So, which means uh, in uh, in in the right figure, you can see there are multiple choice uh, of the paths to to access the, uh, the same SaaS application. For example, a user in the in the site one can access the SAS uh, directly through the CPE one or go through the CPE two and go, uh, go through the MPS network and uh, access the cloud or go through CPE three, go to another internet path and uh, uh, access the SAS uh, application. The problem is which path is the best for this application. To do that, we need to collect the path performance metric uh, of the of each path, and uh, it needs to be advertised to other CPE, so the other CPE can combine the path metric and generate this kind of table for each application uh, of the each, each path. Uh, first, uh, uh, use use this figure as an example. The CPE three can measure the uh, path three dash one uh, and path four dash one performance, and pass this result to the CPE one. So CPE one uh, combined with the uh, path performance of the SE one terminal, it can generate this table to pick the best path for this application. So to do that, we need to uh, pass the ad 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 advertise the SAS path performance uh, metric. The key of the uh, SAS performance uh, metric will be the uh, uh, the path performance metric for specific paths to a specific SaaS application. So the key will contain two parts. The first part is to identify the paths. The path is identified by the uh, first it's been known to which size, site ID and uh, go from the which interface of this site. That can be identified by the local index or MPS label or SRV6. It depends on the data plan and uh, it need to some sometimes in one side there will be multiple se1 nodes so it also need a se1 node id and the other part is about to identify the app application uh, we designed two 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 fields the first field is uh, application id the id is used because the ip of the SaaS application may vary between the different sites so we need a separate id to identify that and we are, for the same app, they may have different requirement for the pass, uh, just, uh, just design three levels. And we design a new type of BGP SE1 uh, NRI. Uh, it's a new root type. The encoding is shown in the right figure. You lost focus. Yeah. 
So for the past performance metric is kind of the key value, the value part. The metric will include the past measurement result. For example, the typical QS, uh, DNA, North Jitter bandwidth, and the past QS will be aggregated ba based on these above factors. And we also include the SAS ap application name or SAS application domain name. Uh, for this metric, we have two options of encapsulation. The first will be the metadata pass attribute defined in this uh, edge service metadata. And the, uh, the second one is the tunnel encapsulation. I think we prefer the first one because it's kind of related to the, to the cloud side, the pass to the cloud side, uh, not uh, the SD1 tunnel, uh, tunnel performance. And we would like to discuss about this application ID used in this SE1 scenario. Uh, we use an application ID because the IP address and the domain name cannot uniquely identify a um, SaaS application. The IP of a SaaS ap application varied based on location when they deployed in the cloud. They may deploy the in different data center using different IP. And the domain name may be shared by many different SaaS applications. For example, the Google.com may host many different uh, SaaS apps, so it cannot identify the uh, one specific SaaS app. But the, the SaaS application name and domain name is still useful for the for the ops and the management stuff. It's, it cannot uh, uh, use it as the as the key. So about this application ID, uh, there are two options. First, it can be assigned by the controller. Uh, the application will be identified in the in the CPE using various uh, technology, and uh, it can uh, ask the controller to assign an application ID, or it can be a global registry for the different application. But I think global registry may be really hard to get get standardized. So that's all I want to present, and we would like to seek feedback and comments. Uh, for example, do you have any thoughts on the application ID and uh, what kind of pass metric is useful and how to combine different pass metrics? And for the encapsulation, do we use metadata pass attribute or tunnel attribute? Any questions or comments are welcome. Thanks. First question, Makamana. Makamana Misra, uh, Cisco Systems. So I have a basic question here that even carrying all these information, is BGP is the right place? Because your performance metric will keep changing dynamically. How many BGP updates we are going to generate? And these performance metrics are shared fate between multiple applications. So why not to keep it completely independent and take local decisions of best path based on whatever metric you have? So to me, it looks like BGP may not be the right place to carry this information at all to start with. Yeah, the background is in the SC1 network. So the BGP is used as the control plan for the for the SC1. So we we choose to extend BGP to pass this metric. We we can take it to the list, but I think there is a there is some more thought needed to can we separate these two things completely? So you mean extend it to other scenario, not not only for SC1. Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, I just have a working group chair head on uh, 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 um, operational question. Are you going to present it to any other working groups like CATS? This is not the same mm, problem as the CATS. CATS is about yeah, selecting the uh, Case is about selecting the backends, backends uh, computing instance. Are you doing the network-wide computing here? This is uh, more about which path uh, for the for the specific application. Got it. But yeah. is it an end path or is it the path in the middle of the network? Uh, is it for the workloads? Yeah, uh, it's it kind of. And to end the pass. Yeah. Okay, well, you may want to think about 
mm-hmm. or we can take that offline okay this is jeff so uh, my comment overlaps uh no cares a little bit and this is actually directed not only to yourself but the next two presentations that we're about to have what we're starting to see is a trend and this is the point that was just made by makamana is uh we, we have a set of uh, potentially very dynamic information getting ready to be injected in the BGP. And we know that that can be very problematic based on BGP's convergence properties. So that is some, certainly going to be one point of analysis that working groups can be asked to work through for every one of these proposals. You know, how much dynamic information is in there? How does the protocol react for it for its deployment scenario? And you know, also just questions about how many path attribute points we end up burning you know, for these applications. You know, right now we're, we're at the beginning. We have a very small number of them. You know, we have basically, I'm going to say about five different proposals on the table, three of them being presented today. And if we end up uh, rapidly burning through things, we don't have an infinite number of these things. And we may want to look at making a much more generic mechanism. Perhaps this overlaps with the cat's work after all. And maybe it uh, is where we eventually take the work as a piece of generic passing compute metrics you know, via BGP for path selection purposes. So this is not specifically a comment to you, although it's sort of a warning. This is uh, how we will be analyzing your work. But it's also that uh, this is going to be a more general problem we're asking the working group to take a look at. Next in queue is Louis Chen. Yes, uh, Louis, uh, independent. So my, my comment on this one is, unless you have the multi-vendor situations or you want to interrupt between vendors, then you take it to BGP. Otherwise, I don't see why you just don't implement proprietary in a way that whatever you like, that will be fine. Unless you make it a standard so that every vendor, actually every active vendor do the same thing, then it makes sense. But I don't see this is required because it's so much, I mean, limited in this case, right? So different vendors are different kind of uh, use case. Okay, that's my comment. Andrew? Hi, Andrew Alston here. Um, sort of wearing my AD hat, but also just my own observations. Reading this draft, I also had the first question that came to my mind is, is this cats? Um, and I think that at the very least, this should probably be socialized in within cats. And then perhaps the discussion could be had as to where this actually belongs. Because when you, as you just said, is it's end to end, there is information in there. And I will also say that from an operator perspective, I'm getting a little bit worried about all of the things we are trying to dump into BGP and it's making it more and more complex. And um, that can create operational headaches for operators when things go wrong, because the more that you dump into BGP, um, the more chances are something goes wrong. So this, I, I have concerns about continuing to dump things that have very little relation to what BGP was originally intended for into BGP. But also, yeah, I really think that you need to socialize this in CATS and then the discussion can happen um, as to where this belongs once they've seen it and you know we've seen it and can figure out where it belongs. Thanks. And directly addressing that, uh, you know, that particular cat is out of the bag for a very long time. You know, uh, we, we have uh, best and other things like that, BHBLS. So your, your concerns are heard, recognized, and mostly mocked. I, I, no, no, no. Jeff, 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 I will point out that you can put many cats in a bag, but a bag has a limited size until the bag bursts. <laughs> yes, and do so, uh, Besley, here. I'll, I'll probably uh, uh, give a feedback on what Louis said. Uh, while you want to think about proprietary aspects, the number of TLVs that has been defined in the draft, you certainly want the TLV numbers to be registered somewhere. It should you go down that path so that at least uh, whether you do that in CATS or in BGP, wherever the work goes through, you probably want to register those so that there are no conflicts in the TLVs and, and, and the attributes, yeah. Okay, we have no further questions. 
Thank you for your presentation. They expect a lot of discussion on these points in the mailing list. Our next presentation is going to be Linda you know, with B2B extensions for 5G edge service metadata. And again, overlaps some of the prior conversational points. So please keep those in mind as you're watching the presentation. Good morning. Uh, oh. oh, sorry. So um, this just gave an update of the discussion on the mailing list primarily. And this draft is really to apply for a new metadata pass attribute. It's less about the matrix, which CAT's working group is charted to discuss. So in the BGP, we're proposing a pass metadata pass attribute. So this has been in the working group for a while. Doesn't work. Okay. So here are some major changes um, over the mailing list discussion. Um, so in the dash 11, um, we have this um, site ID, uh, site index, um, uh, cap capability, um, capacity availability index to the, the metadata. So speak closer and louder to the microphone. Okay, so this is, um, we did some clarification. This is really indicating a group of routes which is not related. Some may be IPv4, some may be IPv6, some may be VPN, but they have some common physical um, uh, commonalities, like maybe in a um, same pod, maybe in the same row of shelves, or maybe on one side, uh, indicating one some a fault failure, uh, like a fiber cut, a power outage, the entire number of routes being impacted. Instead of many individual route withdrawal, um, the egress router can send one message uh, with his own loopback address as the, the NLI to indicate all the routes associated with the site ID are not, no longer available. Um, so in previously, we described the egress router sending out the standalone message indicating the percentage available. Um, but for the individual routes, we didn't indicate whether this availability percentage is, uh, the, how do they, um, we, we didn't put restriction on those value. So thanks to Jeff uh, comments, uh, one flag is added so if flag indicate is one, that means the value, this message is really for association, associate the routes with the site index, uh, site ID. And um, when the flag is zero, is sent out by the egress router with his own loopback address to indicate all the routes associated with this ID are um, withdrawing, basically no longer available. Um, second major changes is um, um, in a security consideration to prevent um, this message, uh, this past attribute being leaked to um, un unintended uh, routers. So um, the way it does is we're adding using this uh, um, non-advertised community, well-known community to the, the packet, uh, to the update message so that um, the ingress router, when they receive it, they will not forward uh, to other routers. Um, there are some other uh, changes like error handling. We kind of did some cleaning up, uh, merged um, several area, uh, several section. We have error handling. We merged them all together under the uh, section A on the error, error handling. Um, there are lots of comments from Tom Patch and it's mainly regarding to the error handling. Like when we have multiple attributes, uh, what will be the behavior um, when there are multiple matrix included in the metadata uh, pass attribute. And if one of them go out of the uh, this, um, designated range, and those um, um, sub TLV should be ignored as if they are never been there. And we add a few uh, clarified lots of uh, description on this. Um, there are some other um, 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 discussion on the mailing list uh, about the next hop, a resulting next hop and uh, how the path is selected, like based on the traditional BGP um, a decision point, maybe pass, um, like for example, maybe going to a uh, path to R1 is selected. 
but with added information of the metadata attributes, R2 becomes a um, better one. Um, and also that um, um, constraint uh, route is um, added, like Jeff suggested that um, um, right now we are in 11, we are describing using the IP address and Jeff suggested we should use, uh, apply a new uh, route target to just pull for this purpose. Like when you have a group of, because uh, lots of um, um, in the 5G, um, domain, they could be um, multiple, um, uh, many ingress routers, um, but maybe only a small set of ingress routers are interested in this particular service. So they are using the IFC 4684 to uh, register they're interested in this particular uh, routes. And um, um, we should have um, a new route target, which is not equal to a VPN a route target to indicate interested parties. So the raw reflector can scope the um, propagation to only the uh, ingress router who, are, who has registered to this service. And on top of that, um, there are quite a few comments from um, China Mobile and ZTE uh, because they have implementation as well. They want to clarify uh, lots of uh, writing. Um, so here is the um, major thing we want to achieve with this draft is mainly to apply this uh, metadata pass attribute. And in this document, we listed a few um, um, uh, indexes, um, sub TLVs, which can be carried by the metadata um, pass attribute. So um, next step is um, we want to apply for the early allocation for the metadata pass attribute. And um, um, you have seen on the list, there's a second uh, implementation is on the way and they're going to send a report. And the next thing is working group, last call. Thank you. Hey, Linda, Jeff. So the, the primary thing and partially what triggered a lot of the uh, burst of review is asking for the you know, path attribute code point. And we like to have uh, this, this specification in a much more stable mode before we actually do that. Uh, I think we have a lot of good progress towards uh, you know, the feedback that you were uh, needing for that. So we're gonna continue to iterate over that and hopefully we'll stabilize and we can uh, move forward with that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other comments? Ketan? Ketan uh, Talaulikar, Cisco. Uh, I saw that the implementation report referenced some code point which has not been allocated. And now there is a second one up. Uh, I would suggest to use the experimental code points for that. So uh, changing the um, draft to be experimental status? Just no. the code point that oh, you are using. Point. Oh, okay. Yes. okay. Because I, I agree with Jeff that this is not yet stable or ready. Okay. Okay, thank you. Yeah, in particular, the, I did a presentation for IDF in IEPG, Grow, and IDR at various points on code point allocation strategies. And the fundamental thing is do not ship code you know, that has you no know, code points assigned that are for unstable features. Those cause global outages, and it's embarrassing. <laughs> so is any temporary code we can use before it's permanently allocated? Uh, do not ship the code. You can do whatever you want in your own labs. <laughs> okay. Because changing this part is not that hard from implementation perspective. It's yeah. just the number, right? So currently we're using one number and then we're just waiting for this to be allocated. Mm -hmm. So at least um, the vendors who support um, did implementation, they can use the same number. Exactly. So I'll, I'll forward uh, a link to the list about uh, the uh, early allocation discussion so you can actually see how that uh, could work. Uh, channeling a comment from uh, Lo in the chat uh, saying, isn't an incoming working group last call a counterindication for the allocation? So Lo, uh, you're correct. Uh, we are probably too early at this point based on the analysis to actually start working group last call. So we will continue iterating before we get to that point. Thank you. Uh, and there's one final one, Abdul Salam. Yes, uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, I, I, I'm, I have a little uh, question regarding the, uh, the security considerations. 
Uh, I need uh, uh, your uh, your opinion regarding uh, the section. It considers saying that uh, uh, it can use uh, 7454, and I was expecting to say we should use uh, 7454 uh, uh, as the uh, security con uh, uh, consideration. Okay, thank you. I'm looking to that. Okay, that's it. Thank you. Okay, our next presentation shall be computing resource notification domains in the network. There we go. Uh, yes, uh, hello everyone. Uh, can you hear me? We can hear you. Uh, yeah, thank you. And this is Yue Jia from China Mobile, and I will present the uh, computing resource notification domain in network. And uh, this is also our first time to present this draft. And next slide, please. And uh, as for the background of the uh, draft, I think here, uh, uh, since the new uh, services are rising and the computing and network convergence has become a new trend, and uh, we all hope that network could schedule the service traffic considering also the computing metric. And also here we uh, give some, uh, I think, uh, further information of the uh, computing information notification. Uh, we think that the basis are the computing measurement and the computing identification. And with the computing measurement, uh, it can evaluate the amount and also performance of the computing resources. And with the computing identification, the, ident uh, the computing resource can be identified. And then the uh, computing resource can be uh, represented for each computing resource provider. And we think that is the uh, uh, basis for our draft. And uh, there are several ways for the network to get the uh, computing information of the computing resource providers. And by the computing information notification schemes, the routers in the network can sync the uh, connected local computing information among themselves and eventually forming a global compute computing uh, information. Uh, next slide, please. So, uh, as for the computing uh, information notification schemes, here we try to give a, a brief introduction. And since the routers need to be aware of the computing information of the data centers, and for the router which connects the uh, computing resources, uh, after it obtains the information of the connected computing resources, it needs to uh, further send the computing information to the neighbor uh, routers, and which is the uh, process of the computing information notification. And here also we have figures uh, try to uh, explain the scope of the uh, computing information notification schemes. It's among the routers to sync the computing information resources. And the next slide, please. Uh, yeah, and here we want to uh, discuss about what the problems with the uh, computing information notification scheme. And there may be multiple uh, schemes, and uh, among them, one important one is that uh, the computing information status uh, could be uh, notified by uh, extending BGP. And uh, uh, if we don't define the uh, scope of the notification, and then the, all the routers on the whole network need to uh, maintain the computing information of the uh, whole network, and uh, causing the uh, routing table is too large, and also uh, have some extra burden to the network and the routers. And we think that's uh, uh, the key problems here. And uh, uh, extending PGP, uh, BGP without limiting the scope, uh, it will increase the amount of the uh, computing information in the network and also uh, on the other hand, we, we, we noticed that the uh, service scheduling is always among the uh, near uh, computing nodes, and we don't need to uh, schedule the uh, service requests uh, to very 
uh, to to verify uh, computing nodes. Uh, so we think that to reduce the useless computing information not, not, notification and to improve the efficiency, we need to introduce the uh, efficiency computing information notification scheme. And uh, uh, next slide, please. Uh, yes, and here as for the uh, computing information notification scheme, uh, one uh, important concept is the uh, notification domain. And here, since uh, the routing systems have the control plane and the forwarding plane, and uh, to achieve the uh, coordination of computing and networking, uh, the control plane need to obtain the uh, computing information and also monitor the related uh, status. And uh, as described here, we refer to one uh, dropped in, in CATS, and the uh, representation and encoding of the computing metrics is crucial. And uh, we think that uh, for the notification domain, uh, is that the routers only send the computing information to the routers located in the given notification domain. Uh, for example, if that um, router one is outside of the uh, notification domain of router two, and then the router two will not send the computing information to the router one. And we think that the notification domain needs to be defined accurately and also the requirements uh, here we propose several requirements uh, for, for, for reference and information. And uh, next slide, please. Uh, yes, here uh, we think firstly, as for the uh, requirements, it needs to uh, support to uh, determine the uh, notification domain based on the computing service topology. And here the computing service topology means that uh, we have the information about the uh, service identification and also the information about the service location. And uh, uh, based on that, uh, we can uh, define the uh, notification domain. And secondly, it should support to uh, define the domain based on the geographical location. And uh, to consider the division of the uh, areas with the same service deployment, and uh, for 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 the service uh, deployed in uh, uh, near uh, locations, we can uh, define these locations as one uh, notification domain. And the third one is that uh, we can uh, reuse the existing uh, AS domain in the uh, BGP systems. And also, in this case, we can consider the uh, distance issues uh, of the notification domain. Yeah. And next slide, please. And yeah, and uh, another requirement is that uh, we think that the notification uh, domain needs to be uh, dynamically adjusted uh, once the uh, network status uh, uh, we, we need to consider the network status information and when the network status is good maybe the uh, notification domain could be expanded and when the network status is bad uh, we can consider to uh, reduce or limit the notification domain and the last one is that uh, the notification domain, uh, domain is uh, required to uh, divide it according to the uh, services. And we need to consider the number of the uh, service nodes deployed in the uh, notification domain. Yeah, I think that's uh, the uh, several points for the uh, requirements. And uh, uh, next slide, please. Uh, here we try to give an uh, example process uh, of how we perform the service scheduling based on the uh, notification domain. And I think the first step is that the central consumer needs to uh, define the uh, notification domain. And here we give several options that maybe uh, adopted one central controller to uh, define the domain. And the first is that based on the computing service topology, and here also the top topology including the identification of the service and also location information of the service, and then it needs to uh, advertise the uh, service topology information and then uh, based on the uh, service topology information, uh, the service real time status information can be obtained based on that topology. And then the uh, notification domain could be defined based on the division of areas with the same, ser uh, same service deployment. And uh, during the implementation here, we may have several uh, methods to build the computing service topology and to obtain the real time service information. And next slide, please. 
and also we have option two and option three for the controller to de de uh, determine the notification domain. And for the option two here, we, we can uh, consider the geographical location and uh, we can use the AS domain uh, as a uh, reference information and also combining the network status uh, uh, of different regions. And uh, option three is that uh, except the uh, AS domain or network status information, we can also consider the service deployment information to consider the uh, definition of the notification domain. And uh, next slide, please. Uh, yes, after the uh, definition of the notification domain, the central controller advertises the notification domain policy, and uh, it also can uh, be carried through uh, several different ways. And also, uh, we can consider the uh, different ways to uh, achieve the uh, limit of the uh, computing information notification. And the one way is that we can limit the number of the AS uh, through the uh, computing information not, uh, update, computing update information passes and to limit the uh, hop. And uh, another way is that routers in the same notification domain uh, could be divided uh, into the same community. And uh, we can use the uh, BGP community attribute to identify the uh, notification domain. And the step three is that after we uh, advertise the policy and then the nodes could uh, advertise the community information within the notification domain. And the step four is that when the uh, controller uh, schedule the service request, uh, it could select the uh, computing nodes that need to obtain the real-time status uh, through the uh, generated uh, computing service topology and send the detection packet to uh, obtain the service status information. Yeah, uh, next slide, please. And uh, the last uh, one is that here we can uh, support the uh, adjustment of the notification domain. And here uh, we can uh, combine the network status information and also service scheduling result feedback and also service deployment information to adjust the uh, notification domain. And uh, uh, when the network status is uh, good, it could be expanded, and when it's bad, it could be reduced. And uh, also, according to the service deployment, uh, the size of the notification domain could be adjusted accordingly. And next slide, please. Yeah, and I think that's all for this draft, and we try to give some uh, gap analysis and also uh, requirements analysis, and also the uh, example of the process is provided, and uh, any comments are welcome. Thank you, Chair. Okay, okay uh, Patel, um, and speaking as a working uh, group chair, you are going to take this to CATS and socialize it there, right? Um, uh, chair, yeah, I, I, we think that uh, since you can see here, our draft focus on the inter-domain issues, and but for cats, uh, for 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 now, it focus on the single domain issues. So, uh, till now, maybe we don't have the plan to 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 discuss this with cats. I suggest you consider socializing it. Um, yes, yeah, I think we we can do that. And Jeff has, uh, so preempting the point I was going to make, uh, the ADs are looking perplexed. So if CATS is chartered for only intra-domain issues, I suspect that there's going to be a suggestion about rechartering that. Um, but moving into the more relevant points, uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, this, this has been a good discussion about some of the properties we will likely want for something that is BGP or BGP-like. Uh, for carrying cats-like data around. Uh, this one is much more abstract presentation than the prior two. Uh, and certainly this is a good discussion to continue, although I think that uh, the pr discussion probably needs to be scoped a little bit better, uh, mostly, again, I'm sorry, in cats, since that's where the work is being uh, discussed for this sort of thing. And then once we've gone there, we can look at how do we make these things work in BGP. Yeah, yes. Okay, Sue, you have the mic. 
I think that was uh, close to my question. My question is, if you have BGPLS, uh, which has a lot of information, plus communities, what else, what can't you do with what you already have? Thank you. Uh, sorry, you mean uh, as for BGPLS, uh, it can already support the related uh, requirements? I'm, I'm simply asking you, yes, what in our existing toolbox of BGPLS or communities for, or uh, RTCs um, do you not, does not solve your problem at this point? I'm not asking about the architecture, but the mechanisms. Um, yes, and we think that here, uh, after our draft focusing on the uh, uh, computing information notification among the routers, and uh, so maybe BGPLS is uh, um, not in our consideration, and uh, we try to... Perhaps uh, we should take yeah. this to the list and um uh i'll ask the question there would that work chairs okay. i think that's probably productive thank you thank you yeah yes thank you john you have the mic john scudder um i'm not the ad of this group and i'm not the ad of cats um but i am a routing ad and i'm pretty sure that this kind of thing was supposed to be in scope for cats. So anyway, uh, as Jeff said, the collectively speaking, the routing ADs have taken an action item to go and review things and, you know, try to answer this question a little more definitively. Uh, in the meantime, I think we should assume that the cats working group is the appropriate place to go talk about compute in the network kind of topics. Um, and that it is premature to start um, developing solutions before the CATS architecture is different, finished, for example. Um, and then I would also like to just very quickly make a comment um, as an anonymous you know, general working group member, which is um, just because we can doesn't mean we should. Um, and I'm not persuaded that BGP is the right protocol to be solving this problem in at all. Um, thank you. Okay, there are no further questions in the queue. Thank you, Shah, for your presentation. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Okay, our next two presentations uh, are going to be starting with uh, Zhidong. Uh, both of these presentations cover addressing deficiencies in RT constraints, specifically for hierarchical route reflection. Xi uh, is going to be representing a draft that uh, is currently a IBR document that attempts to address this issue. And then following uh, this sort of brief reminder of what the already chartered work is, uh, Satya will be presenting a potential alternative. Okay, uh, morning everyone, this is Jadon from Huawei. I'm going to give a brief uh, presentation about this uh, draft on the RD constraint for hierarchical R scenario. Okay, a little bit uh, recap. Uh, this document analyzes the issues with the RT constraint in the hierarchical R scenarios uh, with the current RT constraint road rules. Uh, some route, the routers may fail to be used to build the route distribution graph correctly uh, for the VPN routes. So uh, this document proposed some candidate solutions to fix this RTC issues in the hierarchical R scenario. Uh, actually, this discussion was initiated back in uh, 2014, and this document was adopted in 2015, so it's a long history. Uh, but recently, there are uh, new proposals on solving these RTC issues in the hierarchical R scenario. So we will have the, uh, them presented in the next. Uh, here, uh, maybe we think the working group may want to take a uh, both the existing and the new proposals into consideration and to try to figure out a converged solution to solve this issue. 
Okay, uh, here is the, uh, the problem scenario. Like we can see this, this is a hierarchical car in this network and the route with RT1 uh, uh, can be from the P1 or P3 or P4. And with RT constraint, this RTC route will need to be firstly advertised between these PEs and going to the R in different hierarchy. Uh, with the current rules, when this uh, RTC route uh, information or route it reaches uh, R1 in a higher level. It will be uh, one of them will be selected at the best RTC routes, and it will be advertised to the both of its uh, clients. Uh, in this case, if this uh, route from the R2 is selected, it will be advertised back to the R2 with this cluster ID uh, of the both the cluster one and the cluster two carried in the cluster list. Uh, in this case, R2 will discard this uh, received RTC routes due to this uh, 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 cluster ID uh, check. And in, as a result, the R2 will not advertise any wrapping routes from uh, P1 uh, with RT1 to the R1. Because of this, there's no RTC uh, filtering uh, rules uh, generated on this uh, corresponding interface. So here, uh, this draft proposed two options for the as a solution. The first one is we uh, propose to use add pass for the RTC routes between the hierarchical R's so that it can ensure that uh, on different R's, they can always get the, uh, if sufficient RTC routes, which can pass this BGP loop detection. Uh, and this, the advantage of this mechanism, there is no change to the BGP pass selection rules. And another option is to, uh, to in, because this is caused by the R in the lower level receive the RTC routes uh, advertised by itself. So maybe another option is the, to ask the higher level R to advertise a, a most disjoint alternative route to the peer from which the best route is received. Uh, this, uh, in this uh, draft, it, uh, most of disjoint alternative paths is can have the difference in the cluster list and origina originator ID attributes from the, those of the best routes. But in this case, uh, it seems that the path selection rule for the RTC address family needs to be changed a little bit. Okay, uh, so this is the uh, brief uh, recap of this draft. Uh, the, for the next steps, we think uh, we can continue the discussion with both the authors of other drafts and the working group so that we can provide a converged solution on this issue. Okay. Hey, Kier Patel Ark speaking as a working group member. I think both implementations um, um, or well-known implementations back in the day that implemented RTC does exactly this. They actually overwrite it when RR reflects it to another client uh, so that you don't, um, um, you don't see your own route back and say it's a loop. Yeah, it's for not a hierarchical R case because of the draft. The RFC actually mentioned the rewrite of the originator ID and the next hop, but the cluster list ID is not covered in that case. Got it. Yeah. And Jeff has hitting the opposite point. Uh, so I'm aware personally of at least two implementations that implement the add paths flavor of this and that the uh, other option would also work perfectly fine, but I'm not uh, aware of any of those. So, you know, we, we do have, I had actually been hoping to uh, start a working group last call on this, uh, but it seems, uh, you know, it's time to restart the conversation. So uh, we have uh, one further question in the queue. Krishna Swami. I just want to make a quick point. Yeah. Uh, Krishna Swami, uh, Cisco Systems. Uh, can't this be, uh, you know, treated similar to the AS loop, right? Through policies, you know, you could uh, allow uh, the cluster if you see the same cluster list, right? Because this is anyway new, different office office, and only for this RT constant office office you could uh, allow it. So, why do you need to make any modifications? Have you considered that? You mean you don't need to consider the loop in? Uh... RTC Afisafi? Yeah, similar to, you know, in the AS loop also, right? We, if we do allow uh, routes with your own AS. Mm -hmm. So have you considered that? Yeah, that is one option. Does the, uh, 
uh, maybe in some cases there will be real loop happen because you ignore this uh, loop detection rules. Okay. Yeah. So, so maybe, maybe we can find why don't we have a a more safe solution to make it. Uh, no, because this is pretty scenarios. much in a constrained environment, right? The same loop would even happen in the in the AS uh, part two. There will be no traffic loop, but the route can be I, advertised back and forth. Yeah, I, if I can jump in, because uh, uh, if you do that, then you will need to care, definitely carry no export and break the propagation because you don't know how many levels of hierarchy are in there. So okay. um, you can do that, but then no export has to be set, which says don't propagate this path beyond one hop. One. And my other comment was, yes, you're right. This is a hierarchical RR case. In that case, the implementation is to add path. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. As Jeff said. Thank you, for G, G, for getting us back to where we are. Satya, why don't you uh, come up and give us uh, your side of the proposal? Hi, uh, Satya Mohanty from Cisco Systems. I will present this draft uh, on behalf of my co-authors, Juan and Minmay. So thanks to Jai, he has introduced the problem. So I will save on some slides. But uh, when I looked at this problem to make it uh, tractable, we just thought that we should define something called as RR canonical network in which it means that an RR once it sends to a client, it doesn't get that RT constraint route back. Otherwise, there are issues. It's not in this version of the draft, but I won't go into that, but there are some issues. So this one already explained. Oh, yeah. So I will start off from where uh, Jai ended. So the problem with add path is that the add paths need to be configured, and therefore an it's a increased number of paths need to be advertised. And then decision on what paths to be advertised also increases the burden, right? And the second one is actually how disjoint the paths are from the best path. And those need to be sent to the lower level RRs, right? So that is kind of breaking the BGP update packing. So that's an unoptimal thing. So when we looked at this problem, we thought how to simplify this. So in line with what Krishna commented, what we are doing apart from the originate, overwriting the originator and the next stop, we actually want to overwrite the cluster list, but we simply cannot like overwrite the last prepended cluster ID. We will have to overwrite the whole thing. And I will, I'll explain what that is. And this rule is when we are reflecting a client to another client. We won't do anything except prepending when we are reflecting from non-client to client or client to non-client. Okay. So let's say there is an RT constraint route or the RT1, which P3 is advertising to RR5. So RR5 will add its cluster, let's say like C3 cluster ID, and then RR5 will send to RR3. RR3 will do the same because uh, it's coming. So the sorry, one thing I should have said is RR1 is the higher most RR in the hierarchy. RR2 and RR3 are the clients of RR1 and RR4 and RR5 are the clients of RR2 and RR3 and so forth and so on. So then we were at RR3, RR3 will send to RR1. We will just append C2. Now at RR1, it got from a client and it is reflecting to another client, right? So it is going to overwrite all the cluster IDs with itself and add its own. And that that's like regular BGP adding its own, prepending it. So RR2, when it sees the update, it sees C1, C1, C1. And then RR2 gets for RR2, RR1 is non-client, right? So RR2 will just add itself to, and so the cluster becomes, cluster list becomes C2, C1, C1, and C1 at RR2 when it advertise, advertises to RR4, and which will then you know, it, it, it is going to accept the update. So there is another thing that it's, it's an interesting case. And today in the RT constraints, 
the RFC says that when you advertise, the RR advertise the route to the client, it overrides the next stop and the originator ID, right? And the way we have done this, we came across some interesting issues. I don't know if others are aware, but instead of overwriting the next stop, we can potentially just ignore the next stop. Okay. So we will not take the next stop into consideration, right? because that metric can cause problems. Uh, I will, it's not advancing. It should. Okay. Yeah, so before that, I want to actually go back. So here, see, this is an interesting issue. Suppose, so because of the, okay. At our focus is at RR1, right? So when, because it's a client to client reflection case, we overwrite the next stop. This is according to the existing RFC today. Now the next stop becomes RR1 and then um, it comes to RR2, right? And let's say at that point, the update from, so, so okay, I, I will, how do I explain this better? Okay. So consider this at RR2, I got the update from RR4, which I considered as best. Next stop was RR4, right? Or next stop was P1. Now at RR2, I sent to RR1 and RR1 advertised it as best because it considered my update as best. I am at, I, I am at RR2. So at RR2, the next stop of that route is RR1, right? That path. And let's say the IGP matrix at RR2 for RR1 is better than the IGP matrix for P1. So there is some little bit of instability. You see that? So when we ignore this next stop thing, next stop, we ignore the next stop, then we don't, we, it will be the best path selection and propagation of RTC routes will be more stable. I uploaded the new version today. It probably explains better there than what I'm explaining. And, <laughs> uh, but I think people who are initiated in this will get it quick, right? And the second solution, I think, is a very direct solution, and this seems to be very foolproof. So what we do is when the second level RR sees an update with its own cluster ID, just treat it as a received only route. Do not make it eligible for best path or advertise it anywhere. As a, All we really want is a connected graph, right? If you see, it doesn't have your directed acyclic graph, it should be just some kind of loop free. It's a, oh, like a complete oh. thing. And this just solves the purpose. So we have given both proposals. And if you do the rule number one, which is overwriting the cluster, then we don't need rule number two. Otherwise, you can use rule number two. And there is another optimization. I didn't put it here. Uh, but uh, OK, so here you can see that um, RR1 is going to accept the RT filter route, which is itself, right? The, the path that is advertised to RR3 and RR3 reflected it back and RR1 just accepted it. And then the VPN propagation is this way. So the, uh, like the point I was making, I didn't include it here is, suppose there is only one VPN, right? And that VPN, it sends the route target and no one else is interested in that. Today in the RTC, there is no way that you limit the VPN routes from going to the RR, right? Even though nobody needs it. So that can be some further optimization, but I left it out of the scope. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Keir um, Patel. So that's quite commendable that the draft explains it a lot more clearly than the slides. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> But uh, I'd say two more comments to, uh, um, uh, to what you said. Uh, number one, whatever you do, no export is something you should consider because what you have uh, explained is uh, a topology um, on a hierarchy that is a multi-level. And if your lowest level connects to the highest level um, directly and creates a circular dependency, you really want to break that. And one solid way to break that is just to say, don't announce anything I have received so far, and then re-originate whatever you want to re-originate or rewrite whatever you want to rewrite. That is some that is something I'd suggest. Mm -hmm. Second thing is, 
while you are doing this, um, you should really consider there is another draft that talks about the multiple hierarchies of RRs and persistent route oscillations that go inside that with RTC. That was also presented. So I think you want to consider that because I think you're touching that subject okay. with route instability a little bit. But it'd be good to clean that up in one shot um, and say, here are the problems that uh, persistent oscillation uh, related to persistent oscillation, and here are the problems related to um, to 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 um, bad filtering or bad route selections. Whatever they have, there are two classes of two different categories. Okay. Right. Okay. So, in answer to your observations, right? Uh, number one thing I mentioned about canonical networks right where that you cannot just go from lower level to upper level and i think you meant no advertised community not the no export my bad yes that's okay so yeah these are two things but i think both solutions work and pardon me if my my presentation was not clear but if you go through it again yeah this this topic is not very yeah, simple so okay. it takes some time this is, a, you know, Jeff, so you know, my comments overlap. This is a very subtle set of problems to deal with, and it's very challenging to talk about because you have to deeply understand re route reflection. You have to deeply understand, you know, effectively the topology. Uh, channeling, I, I suspect Tony P was going to say, he wandered off from the microphone. Uh, BGP is not a flooding uh, protocol, and it's sort of the consequence here is that the properties we want is a flooding protocol. This is not what we're getting. Uh, the case you gave of, well, we can just accept this route. And even though we won't ever use it for anything besides saying we've accepted it, that's good enough for some pieces of the thing. Uh, the Juniper developers for BGP also looked at a similar solution for overriding portions of the cluster list. Uh, we uh, came to a similar conclusion that you could probably overwrite some of the stuff, but we also we're a little bit concerned about some of the scenarios we're testing that loops might occur if that happened. And the point care is accidentally made, but uh, was incorrect in what he was saying. He was talking about the no advertise, no certain uh, property. When we're doing these types of overrides, uh, we do have potential no export considerations because these routes are also used for inner domain purposes. So if you start breaking which route you should select for inter domain advertisement, we have potential problems to worry about there. So as we look at these solutions, we have to look at the inner domain case as well. Yeah. So thanks. And I just wanted to acknowledge that I did had a hallway conversation with Jeff about two days back on this. Yeah, John, you're next. John Scudder. Um, I was going to apologize for not having carefully reviewed the draft, but then you reminded me that it was just published. So I don't feel so bad. Um, so, so based primarily on, on, you know, what you presented on the slides, um, I think this is sort of related to what Jeff just said anyway, is um, the, the first solution where you start editing the, um, the cluster list scares the living daylights out of me um, because you are going in and meddling with a fundamental correctness mechanism of the protocol. I mean, it is exactly like saying, oh yeah, this AS path thing, you know, we got a constraint topology, so the hell with it. Um, and I think that's um, probably just a very bad idea. Um, mm -hmm. But at the very minimum, if we are gonna even consider doing something like that, it requires a rigorous analysis and something more persuasive than we're only gonna deploy this in a constrained topology. On the other hand, your solution two, where you said, um, if I understand it right, you know, just hang, hang on to this route in my edge or a bin, I'm not gonna use it for anything, but I am gonna use it for filter programming. Yeah. Awesome, I don't feel bad about that at all. Sure, thank so, you. <laughs> smells good, so yeah. thank you. So that was actually the original solution and then we thought because I have it like second solution, but the first solution, as I said, right now it's for canonical networks, the way we define it. But yeah, I understand. And uh, previous observation was made that there could be something like this AS path loop, right? Like how many times you can, we have this config, right? So. Um, there's a huge difference between AS, AS path loop and what you're describing here. So- the... No, here I'm overwriting. I'm saying that similar thing could be used um, 
we just have to accept if we this is in more in line with the second solution is what i was trying to say okay well i i guess we can take the rest offline thank you g yeah jidon from hawaii uh, i'm glad to see this uh, uh, issue being raised again and uh, actually uh, i see two possible issues with this uh, rewrite of this uh, cluster list because uh, the first is you may cause some loops in some specific topologies, right? This is, you don't have this loop of detection mechanism anymore. Another thing is, another thing is um, in case you only have the uh, VPN route receivers on one side and you advertise this route to the high, high level RR, it advertised back. If you rewrite it, it will give this uh, lower level R a filter that we always uh, advertise VPN routes to the higher level R, but actually there's no interest from the other side. This is you may cause some uh, uh, Sorry, waste. I, I, I didn't get the question, but really, okay. Maybe yeah. we can discuss offline, but I think this is a possible yeah, okay. issue with uh, rewriting some of these fields. Actually, uh, in our draft, we always try to get another uh, uh, request of this VPN route from the other side of other uh, um, clients. So this is, uh, you don't uh, get a request from yourself. This is something like that. We don't get... Uh, Maybe we can discuss it. Like yeah. This. Okay. So thank you. That's all the time we have for this topic. Uh, so thank you for the presentations. A uh, couple of uh, working group notes. Uh, the document G presented uh, earlier is the adopted bit of the working group uh, work. Uh, G, uh, we think that's expired. Could you refresh it since this is a uh, no current topic? We're happy to see that this is uh, moving towards progression. Uh, we know that some of the implementations cover the uh, adopted work. We can do further analysis based on what Satya is bringing to the working group, and I think we'll all benefit. Um, the last set of presentations that we have uh, we, we've done well and we, we've actually done uh, what is best about meeting in person we've had good productive conversations uh, we have burned through our slack time so we're going to be trying to keep a little bit more towards the time slots requested so our next presentation is going to be the uh, multi-protocol extensions for IPv4 v6 back thing chung Pang. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity to give this presentation about MPP extension for IPv4, IPv6 mapping advertisement. Uh, next, please. Oh, this one. <laughs> okay. Uh, this document focuses on IPv6 only deployment for multi domain networks managed by a single or multiple operators. With the global deployment of IPv6, uh, IPv6 only has been an important trend and uh, actually is a requirement. Uh, for not skilled operators, the network mainly consists of multi-domains. Uh, some may serve as, uh, some domains serve as metro network, some may serve as backbone and even cloud network, et cetera. Uh, so, but, uh, we found said that for large scale multi domain networks, when they transfer to IPv6 only, they need to consider how to provide connections to IPv4 islands uh, to, to make sure that users can still access IPv4 internet service normally. Uh, during the past decade, IETF has designed uh, several uh, IPv6 only standards, and uh, most of them, many folks are. Uh, access scenario, maybe you know, you know that. Uh, and uh, we found that the MPGPG for IPv6 transit call is missing. And other uh, related approach such as RC55, 65, uh, 65, and 6992, many folks on single domain. So we need a new approaches. This document defines MPP extensions and procedure for IPv4 service delivery. Uh, in multi-domain IPv6 online works. It was proposed January 2023, and firstly provided IETF 116 and the current version 7. Uh, in this document, the existing office suffix compilation is used to 
uh, identifies the reachability IPv4 address block in IPv6 only networks. So its NRI field is a composite IPv6 map address prefix. It consists of uh, IPv6 mapping prefix, the original IPv4, the original IPv4 address blocks and the series pattern B is, is very simple, right? And this information can provide the mapping between uh, IPv6 mapping prefix and the uh, origin IPv4 address block. So it's, um, this, we call it uh, address mapping rules in this context. Uh, in addition, uh, a new pass attribute uh, for map six is proposed in this document. It is in conjunction with the uh, uh, office surface uh, to, to, uh, to, uh, to get the uh, additional information to add, extract the address mapping rules uh, from the BP announcement. So it can be transferred across domains. And now uh, this attribute consists of a length of IPv6 mapping prefix. Uh, it can extract, help to extract the, the uh, mapping rule information from the uh, from NRI field and forwarding types, for example, capsule, in, in, translation or encapsulation, uh, address orange type and some original uh, IPv4 AS informations. So ETDR said uh, proposed by Jeff can also be considered to use for the trans transfer IPv4 uh, information in IPv6 only networks. So right now this attribute is optional and uh, transitive. Uh, since IETF 117, we received not comments, and uh, uh, for the scope, of this attribute based on comments of uh, 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 Susan. So the following thing is added. So it is uh, mentioned that this approach, this document, can be applied not only to the case of closed network, but also to the open networks, as long as network device supports function defined this document. And uh, the security consideration uh, section is also has been revised, and uh, the new mechanic support the translation. Uh, of IPv4 to IPv6 back to IPv4. So the packets may go around some filtering that uh, exists in the original network. In this case, uh, to address this issue, it recommended to configure the corresponding filtering uh, in IPv6, in future IPv6 networks to handle packets that are converted from IPv4 packets. Uh, this is also cons uh, proposed by uh, Sue. Um, the uh, addition of the uh, calculation of these metrics is uh, added in this in the new version. Uh, the these metrics in this context used to uh, for the selection of egress PEs when there are multiple egress PEs. Uh, so for a given address block, of course, if there's only one egress PE, there should, there should be no consider to this metric. Uh, this metric refers to distance from the egress PE to egress PEs in IPv6 only networks for IPv4 service delivery. It is associated with a specific IPv4 address block. When uh, IPv6 node receive a BTP announcement about the route of a given IPv block, it can locally calculate the distance uh, metric for the egress P by counting the number of AS in the distant AS in the IPv6 AS pass attributes. So it's very it's simple. In addition, based on the comments of uh, IDRTS, a number may also has been reduced to five and the several needs have been uh, fixed as well. Uh, during the past, we received our comments and the suggestions uh, from Robert, Cheng Li, Jing, Rui, etc., and other people. Uh, we express our thanks for, uh, for all of them. And uh, we will continue to make further ref rec uh, refinement to improve the full document and uh, uh, comments and uh, suggestions are welcome. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the presentation. We do have questions. First one, Nan Gang. Hello, <coughs> Nan Gang from Power Technology. Uh, thanks for updating the draft. Uh, just from a perspective of both security, you know there are some comments during the adoption call, and uh, thanks for inc incorporating the comments into the updated draft. And uh, uh, just a suggestion, uh, maybe the security consideration sections a section can be refined continuously. Uh, I mean, uh, maybe the potential risks by using the for map six can be pointed out explicitly. Mm, so how to tackle these problems is not the scope of the draft, but 
it will be great to help people understand the potential risks. And I, maybe I, I guess the risks can be solved with existing mechanisms, mechanisms uh, with or without minor uh, changes. Thanks. Oh, thank you. We approve the security uh, consideration sections uh, in the future. Uh, I uh, hope you can give more comments <laughs> next time. Thank you. Okay, Tantalaulikar, Cisco. Uh, so Chongfeng and I have had some discussions uh, offline uh, for the use case, like what's the problem statement here? And I understand that there are two problem statements, actually. One is connecting an IPv4 host to an IPv4 host over a V6 only. And I believe we have solutions for that already uh, with encapsulation. And there is no need for any mapping. There is no need for any address rewriting. Uh, so I strongly believe that we should not invent any other solution than that. If we do, let us get review from Interia, uh, especially because you know we are doing now address mapping where it is probably not necessary. OK, that, that, that's one. Uh, sorry. Oh, yeah, go ahead, please. Uh, OK, I, I know you uh, mentioned the, it mentioned about uh, uh, RFC uh, 16 type, right? Uh, so RFC 54, 54 yes. 49, as it is more popular. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but uh, I think we should uh, consider this from the stand from perspective of networks, right? Uh, for for the case of the IPv6 deployment, uh, IPv6 only uh, should, should guarantee the user's experience. So. Uh, translation, uh, uh, including single translation or double translation, would be considered, right? But now the FC55, C5, right? The, it just does encapsulation. So yeah, the IPv4 packet so customer is encapsulated. Into yeah. Not only uh, encapsulation, but also through the translation. So in this, doc in this uh, document, we uh, it is uh, compatible with encapsulation and the translation. That's my. Uh, yeah, we can discuss more, uh, but I think there is no need for translation when we have encapsulation. It's just going. Uh, but I think the second one uh, use case is more interesting, which is a V4 host, uh, or a, I think it was a V6 host talking to a V4 server. Mm -hmm. And that is where there is a mapping solution. Yeah. And uh, I need to read up uh, to give back, come back. Okay. Where there is a need for mapping, but I'm not again sure if it's something to be done in BGP and a router to do this translation back and forth. Because there is the source address and there is the destination address both. So, uh, but I need to study, so I will come back. Uh, okay, uh, actually, uh, uh, I can give you some uh, some information. Right? Actually, when the zero word document has been submitted, this has been talked with the minister. Uh, yeah, I give my uh, feedbacks and uh, uh, in the thoughts. I think you can check in the minister. However, I think we can discuss this uh, offline about the yes, situation. Sure. Thank we, you. We shall have to take the rest of this to the mailing list. Uh, okay. We're starting to get over time. Uh, Gian, you have a time for a very brief comment. I'm sure. I can hear me. You're audible. OK. Yeah, um, just a quick question. You know, um, with this solution, is there, with the mapping, the four map six, I guess, mapping, is there overhead? It seems like there would be, like, processing overhead on the uh, on the PE, right? If you have many flows and they're, you know, you know all that, it does seem like there would be a lot of processing overhead. So just some thoughts on that. That, that was the question. Thank you. You, you mean the uh, overhead, right? Yes. Yeah, the P, yeah, because uh, this approach adopts uh, stateless mappings, uh, which means uh, we do not care about uh, the mapping, uh, uh, the need, do not need to maintain the, the mapping of port level or single uh, user levels uh, mappings. So this can reduce, uh, uh, can, uh, can guarantee the scalabilities. The route include the uh, P route can, can actually, it can be a, a Route the function only need to do some slice, uh, uh, mapping and uh, packet transformation. So I think this can be uh, uh, overhead can be guaranteed. That's all. So thank you for the presentation. Uh, we're seeing good work happening in the working group. You know the review has been excellent, and we're looking forward to seeing what uh, comes of the next version. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for your time.
So next presentation is going to be Gyan. Uh, Gyan, uh, you have presented this uh, multiple times. Uh, we're yes. tight in time, so we're going to be kept very tightly to your schedule. OK, thank you. Uh, hi, my name is Gyan Mishra. I'm with Verizon, and, and I'm presenting uh, IPv6, uh, IPv4 islands over an IPv6 core, a core PE, on behalf of co-authors. Um, next slide. So the motivation behind four, this 4PE document. So uh, most most everyone's familiar with uh, 6PE. So a standard exists for 6PE, RFC 4798. And I think as uh, Kathan had mentioned, I guess, about the, uh, the previous um, presentation related to format six and encapsulation. So this is kind of a typical encapsulation style solution. Very, very basic, very simple. Uh, but what we're doing is we're doing exactly the same thing that you, that existed with uh, you know being able to carry a, a v4 connecting six islands over a four core with rfc 4798 uh, a standard for that never really didn't exist does not exist for connecting a v4 islands over a v6 core network and so that's really the motivation the main motivation for this uh, document um, so this draft provides an informational document related to uh, providing that uh, standard solution next slide so just a recap on 4PE. Um, as I said, it is it is a uh, it's a encapsulation based solution. So basically, it's a simple. Uh, you have a your transport label, you know, encapsulation that you're carrying. You have a, a IPv6 LSP across your core, a single protocol core, and then you're basically tunneling your v, v4 prefixes over that v6 LSP. And so those v4 prefixes, they they can be either labeled or not labeled in um, 6P, uh, the standard was for labeling the uh, B4, B6 prefixes. And I think that in this draft, really the main reason why that change and shift, I guess, to not label is I, the, the goal of 4PE is being able to carry the public routing cable and a large number of B4 prefixes. And there's really no need to label the B4 prefixes. So this draft does provide that um, Flexibility that uh, you know either you can label it, but you don't you you are limited, and you you have uh, I think a little bit more overhead in labeling all your prefixes, especially if you're carrying the internet table, uh, versus uh, keeping everything all all your uh, customer prefixes unlabeled. Uh, so this draft it, it uses RFC 8950 uh, next hop encoding, 16 or 32 byte next hop encoding. Um, it provides a lot more flexibility than its predecessor 6P, as I mentioned. And then this also supports NRAS options, A, B, C, and A, B, and, and as well supports uh, data plans, MPLS, as well as segment routing, SRMPLS, and SRV6 data plans. Next slide. So uh, just a quick update on this draft. So we changed the draft from standards track to informational. Uh, and then we also uh, made the NRAS, op NRAS A, B, uh, change it from normative to informative since it was not a it's a I, it's a uh, individual draft and then there was a change in the SR policy draft that was split into two different draft the seg types extension so we updated that and then um, we added some use case details into the draft related to the different topmost labels that can be used uh, from the mailing list um, uh, feedback from the working group uh, the use of an arbitrary rate label, implicit null label, or explicit null, so flexibility on what can be used, as well as uh, I would say that in, in the three main um, solutions of, of whether you know to uh, label the V4 prefixes or not label them. Um, so 6PE going down the line of 6PE uh, would and that uh, our the RFC would label all the V4 prefixes. So that is an option with with 4PE that you can. Uh, label the V4 prefixes, uh, but that is not as scalable. I, I would say most operators, as well as I think implementations, do support not labeling the prefixes, and and that that's probably the general use case of you know to not label your V4 prefixes. Uh, there is also as well an option that's documented in the um, draft, as well as having a per CE next top label table where you can have a a, some more granularity, and you can have a labeled a label table per per CE, and then keep the keep the uh, customer prefixes unlabeled. Um, 
So, and lastly, I've, I've added an implementation section uh, for vendors, uh, Cisco, Juniper, uh, Nokia, and Huawei, and, and any, any caveats with their implementations. Uh, all the implementations support both labeled and unlabeled prefixes. Uh, so this, this draft is in queue for workgroup adoption, and if you have not had a chance to read the draft, please do so and provide comments on the mailing list. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Jan, for the update. Uh, we have no time for questions. We're going to move immediately to the next presentation. And that's going to be Shri Hari, the IGB. Yep. Can you hear me, Jeff? You're loud and clear. Wonderful. Hello, folks. Um, this is the presentation on generic metric extensions for the AGP attribute. My name is Shri Sangli. I'm from Juniper. On behalf of all my co-authors, I'm presenting the updates. Next slide, please. Okay. What I will be covering here is just a recap. There's a discussion that happened a couple of weeks ago on the alias. I'm going to just bring in those updates. I've made some updates to the draft, which I posted. I'm going to talk about those and also talk uh, about deployment options and some uh, input that I would like to have from the work group and the operators uh, to go to the next steps. Next slide, please. Quick recap. Um, this is for for uh, what the operators want to provision the intent-based end-to-end path across domains uh, for all the metric types which go beyond the IGP default. Uh, could be any of those categories of delay, bandwidth, and, and, and the new ones that may come up. The 7311 RFC uh, introduces the AGP attribute, but we only have one TLV, which is the AGP TLV, that covered, that carries the default IGP cost as defined there. So the pro this draft proposes a new generic metric TLV, um, which introduced the type and the subfields uh, value that to carry the various uh, metric types in uh, uh, in accordance with the IGP uh, protocol uh, registry. Next slide, please. So the updates to the 05 version, um, we did have the uh, work group adoption call as 05, and since then I've made um, more changes in 06 and there's small editorial changes in 7. Um, so updates to 05 is we've introduced uh, uh, um, flags uh, based on uh, some of the discussions that happened and Ketan, um, Ketan has joined us as the co-author. Uh, so uh, metric flags carry at least these two bits. Uh, one is um, uh, uh, if there's a discontinuity in, along the path uh, that can be introduced uh, by setting this flag. And if the, the metric has been normalized, that can be conveyed through uh, this bit, uh, the end bit. And we also have heard uh, people want to send multiple generic metric TLVs uh, from the originator to express the intent. So it need not be one intent equal to one uh, uh, generic metric TLV. So the draft explicitly allows it. Now, next slide. Um, small uh, incremental updates to 05 uh, because we introduced the flags. The originator BGP speaker uh, will have to set the i is equal to zero and n is equal to zero uh, because that's originating. The non originating, depending on um, if the metric type is unrecognized, uh, it will set as incomplete, which is i is equal to one. And if the metric was normalized, it will set the n bit to one. In the router, with uh, multiple paths with the same generic metric TLV. Uh, so clearly, preferring a, a complete accumulation over incomplete uh, is obvious, as well as uh, somebody, local policy may want to say that I want to prefer something that has not been normalized uh, uh, along the path versus a normalized uh, an accumulation. So uh, that can be controlled by the receiving router who is doing the best band decision. Next slide, please. Okay, I just, uh, I've introduced one more case in case as we introduce new metric types, um, uh, uh, the, if, the, if the domain uh, uh, which doesn't understand, which does not understand the new metric type, it will set the I bit. Uh, uh, therefore, uh, it's uh, uh, the P1 in this picture will have two paths and then it's easy to uh, make a decision on uh, uh, preferring the path which is metric accumulation. Next slide, please. Okay, so I would like to get the work group's uh, uh, feedback on this. Um, as we polled uh, various uh, vendors, maybe there are more implementations. Uh, due to the way RFC 7311 has been described, there are different implementations. And we listed some of them here as I polled. 
some vendors propagate AGB TLV and drop a unrecognized TLV. So which means this will be an issue if we have to support uh, uh, any new TLV like the generic metric TLV. Uh, some, metric, some vendors update AGB TLV with a metric that is different from default uh, AGB metric. So the, any delay bandwidth may have been carried in that. Um, and, and some vendors do not propagate AGB TLV if AG, if AGB TLV is dropped, and even if generic metric TLV is present. Um, so, and maybe there are more, there may be more. So the continuity bit or the I bit uh, uh, does not solve in all the scenarios because uh, the router will propagate the generic metric, uh, uh, will, will propagate the AGP attribute, uh, but it might not have read, uh, recognized the generic metric TLV. So therefore the I bit may not solve in all the scenarios. So the receiving router cannot determine whether the metric uh, has been accumulated fully or somebody has missed it because of the fact that not everybody uh, would have implemented the extensions uh, that we are talking about in this draft. Next slide. Oh, uh, go back to the presentation. I locked the queue. The last slide, uh, Jeff. Okay, the previous one. Okay, the previous one. Sorry. One more. Ah, yeah. So, so I'm looking at a couple options. The draft talks about the option one. Um, let me talk about that. Um, we we continue to because EIGP is a optional non-transitive attribute. Um, we will have to if we have to refer to the continuity bit in that uh, uh, and then make a deterministic behavior then the expectation is all the routers along the path that mod with the next stop have to have to be upgraded with the new uh, support uh, where the draft talks about every router will have to set the i bit if that does not understand or it does not recognize the new metric type if we do not want to go down this path and maybe limit the generic metric tlv uh, 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 separately then uh, uh, option 2 which is not present in the draft. I did not talk about this. I'm just bringing it up to see what the work group uh, uh, thinks about it. Maybe we can introduce AGP v2 and, and try to discontinue given the fact that people have misinterpreted 7311 and have different implementations of AGP v1. Maybe AGP v2 and limiting generic metric TLV only to AGP v2 uh, uh, will do that. But the downside of this, even the route reflectors have to upgrade and, and propagate this because this is unrecognized or this is a non-transitive optional. But the, the thing is, the continuity bit will solve deterministically uh, because if a router does not understand the AGP v2, it will not propagate. And therefore, there is a, the, it's easier to go and identify that router and, and, and have that upgraded. So that's probably is the reason why 7311 in the first place took that option of uh, uh, not providing the continuity. So uh, uh, I'm trying to see what the work group uh, thinks about this. That's all I had uh, looking for any reviews, comments on this. Uh, yeah. So thank you, Shihari. And I'm sorry that there's no time for uh, comments at this point. Uh, so Louis, please take your question off to the mailing list. Uh, Shihari, thank you for in particular, you know, highlighting all the issues that you want to have discussed. I think that is a good way to drive forward list discussion in particular. Thank you. Thanks, Shihari. So the last presentation of the day is a vendor implementation report for BGP BFD strict mode, which uh, Albert and I are both authors. Oh, and AC's in the room too. <laughs> Morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Albert Fu. I'm uh, one of the network engineers in Bloomberg, uh, based out of New York. Uh, very happy to represent my uh, Apple co-authors here uh, to discuss the uh, vendor implementation of the uh, BFD strict mode draft. <coughs> Uh, this is a quick uh, uh, overview of the uh, short presentation that I'm uh, presenting today. I'm going to go through the uh, default BFD implementation as uh, exists today on all the vendors, and then uh, highlight uh, one of the issues it has uh, that we have experienced in our network. And then I'm going to go through some of the changes uh, as uh, proposed in the BFD strict mode draft that addresses this issue. And then I'm going to go through uh, two vendor uh, implementation that's available today. Um, I should also stress that a third vendor is going to be supporting this feature soon uh, in the next month or so. And then I'll conclude by providing a summary. 
So the, the uh, default BGP implementation today is kind of um, uh, undesirable in that the actual protocol BGP is established before BFD is brought up. So there is a little gap in uh, when BGP is up to before BFD is available to do fast failure detection. Uh, and this uh, gap depends on the uh, what's running on the routers. On some of the BC routers, it could take more than 10 seconds before BFD comes up. So if you have a break in the middle problem, which we've seen quite a lot in Metro E type network where the interface stays up, uh, you have to rely on something like BFD to detect it. But if BFD is not up, then basically you have to rely on the actual protocol uh, whole time to detect the failure, which is quite lengthy. So it depends on the vendors, the default timers, you know, 90 seconds on Juniper and 180 seconds on Cisco. So this is an example taken from a production routers in our network. Obviously, I've changed the uh, addresses, uh, uh, you know, just for illustration purposes. Uh, it's one of the BC routers. We have learning full internet routes. Uh, we have about 917,000 routes being learned. The messages that's shown here, it's quite typical uh, when you have BFD detecting uh, a failure. So you see BFD timeout, and then it brings down BGP, which is what we want BFD to do. Uh, the next set of messages show uh, BGP coming up currently before BFD. So I did some calculation here. So this particular router, it took 11 seconds. So particularly when you have a flapping links, that 11 second is quite long. Uh, you could have a, a you know, telco issue where packets not going through. Uh, because the interface stays up, you wouldn't have any uh, other mechanism to detect the failure except the uh, protocol whole time, which is quite lengthy. And in most network, 90 seconds or 180 seconds is not an acceptable uh, time to detect failures. So what I'd like to do now is to go through what's proposed in the BFD strict mode draft to address this issue. Uh, the, with, this ch with the changes in the draft, what we want to do is make sure that BFD is up before BGP. So that way we can make sure that there is always BFD to, to do fast failure detection. Um, there is a, a capability that's uh, mentioned in the draft, uh, option 74, which is part of the um, capability exchange uh, in the BGP open messages. So if you look at how uh, a BFD works in the default mode, you know, after the three-way TCP handshake, the open messages are exchanged. And then after that, the keep lives are sent. And then the BGP session is established. Then currently the BFD is then signaled to come up, which could take, you know, variable time, depending on what's running on the routers. And at the same time, you have the BGP updates being advertised. In fact, in the small network, you could basically have all the route updates completed before BFD comes up. And if BFD is not up and you have a failure, a break in the middle, then you have the, um, you know, the uh, traffic black hole. So with the strict mode draft, the changes we're doing is after the TCP uh, three-way handshake, we exchange the open messages but we delay sending the KIP alive until BFD comes up. Okay, so that way you can ensure that BFD is always up before you start exchanging route updates. Uh, there is a slight uh, uh, enhancement mentioned in the draft called hold down. Uh, we, we, it doesn't talk about uh, you know, how the hold down is implemented. Uh, but in the case of a vendor like Juniper, for example, it's just another timer that says, when BFD comes up, I don't actually want to do BGP updates immediately. I want it to be up for a certain time just to make sure that B the circuit is stable before I start sending the keep alive packets and then have the BGP updates uh, being sent at the same time. Tony, do you want that? No, I can uh, wait till the end. Okay. okay. So what I would like to do now is to quickly go over very quickly the uh, configuration to support strict mode draft on uh, Nokia and Juniper. So with the Nokia, there is a new knob available in 23.7 uh, version. It's called BFD strict mode. Uh, in Junos, 23.4 uh, is what I recommend. Uh, 
there is a knob called strict BFD. And as I mentioned before, Juniper also supports the hold down mechanism. This is really useful and something that we look forward to uh, be using in our network because it helps to dampen flapping links. Uh, some large networks would probably be using what's called interface hold time, to hold up, hold down timers today to dampen uh, flapping links. However, a lot of the link failures we found these days uh, you know, does not involve, involve interface going down. Uh, you know, it's more you know, what I call break in the middle type problem. So this uh, is a really good feature to uh, the dampen the uh, flapping links. So the, um, because the uh, strict mode is part of the BGP capability. So you could, you know, when the session is established, you could actually uh, display the capability and check that uh, the, the routers do support strict mode. Uh, both Juniper and Nokia supports dynamic uh, signaling of strict mode in the sense that both ends must support strict mode in order for the session to be in strict mode. Right. Um, so as I mentioned uh, in the presentation, strict mode is something that I recommend. It ensures that BFD is always up before BGP route exchanges happen. Uh, this same feature is also available with other protocols. I know Key 10 is here. There's an RFC for OSPF strict mode, which we have already deployed. And we're using that uh, with the hold down timers to help uh, dampen flapping wings as well. That comes to the end of my presentation. So I'm open up for questions. Uh, having lived this particularly entertaining hell extensively a couple of years ago, uh, two recommendations. One is, uh, um, if there's any deviation between OSPF and BGP behavior, okay, document extensively, confuse the hell out the customer. I don't think you have, but just observation, okay? Because we had an interesting implementation, we were finding that. The second one, there is another unclear behavior, which in deployment uh, was causing havoc. Uh, what is it? Uh, remote admin enable disable, right? You can flip on the remote side, the BFT up and down. And that was sometimes steering session down, sometimes not, depending on implementation of different products. And that in deployment also caused very nasty surprises. It, this drive may be a good place to put that in since it's basically, you know, tries to tie down all these FSM, loose FSM, you know, problem back, or maybe it merits another draft, but it falls, it's a little more, more subtle version of this problem, but was also seen in deployment. Oh, if I can answer okay. them. So Tony, specifically to that point, uh, the BFD admin downstate, which you're talking about, is explicitly called out inside of uh, this draft. Ah, uh, yeah, I just scanned through the draft, I didn't see it. Thanks. Yeah, yeah the, so conveniently, there's a BFD okay. chair that watches for that sort yeah, of thing. Remote admin was the worst, actually. When the remote side was admin down, when you know the behavior differed, whether you tore it down or not. Hey, Albert Cave, really good proposal. Um, quick question: um, Keep alive's were used, from what I recall, for a really good uh, buffering point against kernels that could not generate fin when a process in the user plane crashed. Typically, TCP would generate a fin, and other guy would know when a write on a socket fails that the process is gone, and therefore they should bring a session down. If they cannot figure it out, Keep Alive is there um, to uh, actually be as a buffer to say after three Keep, keep Alive's, I don't see it. I'm going to time out the session. So the question for you is: Is there a mechanism in here because you are delaying a Keep Alive, and right around the time where you delay the Keep Alive, let's say BFD is up, but the user plane crashes and the kernel has a bug that it cannot generate a fin, how do you go about solving that? Yeah. That would delay it all the way to 180 seconds or whatever the three keeper lives are, right? Yeah, that's a good question. I think, Jeff, you want to check that? Uh, yeah, and uh, there is a basically a dead man timer that is part of the mechanism when we reach that part of the state machine for exactly that reason. We will not linger in there forever. Uh, that value can be as long, as short as you like. We're recommending it be on the shorter side of thing because we don't want to keep BGP from coming up for too long. Yeah, the drop also suggests a default uh, time of 30 seconds. Uh, so Nokia, uh, if I go back to the slides, Nokia actually has a Nokia. Uh, when you configure the advertise, you could actually configure a whole time to say how long you want that, that BFD to, to wait for the BFD to come up. Uh, instead of using the whole downtime, uh, the uh, BGP whole time to time out the session. Got it. Thank you. 
And we are out of time for the session. Thank you for presentations. Thank you for productive discussion. This is what we want to see out of IETF. Please now continue on the mailing list. Thank see you, you one nineteen. Thank you.